1997 is a real turning point in my life. It was during that time that I went from being primarily a performing musician to being a producer and mixer and working in the studio. But it was also important because during that time I met somebody who just happened to show up with a band to help them out on a session they were doing. And little did I know at the time how many sessions I would do with this guy and how much I would learn from him and how much it would change my understanding of my career, production, working with bands, timing, harmony, hard work, all things music. And it was also this person who urged me to start this YouTube channel. That person is Rick Beato. Recently, I was able to interview him and it, it went on for two and a half hours. This episode is an excerpt of that interview. I hope you enjoy. We started working together. Well, we started working together in 97. We did this, uh, the shrunken head and stuff like that. And stuff with, with my band, with Billionaire, 97, 98. But when we started working in 99 together, well, the peak of the music business was 2000. So we started one year before the peak of the music business. But we had no idea that that yeah. was happening at the time or where it was going to go. I mean, it's crazy, Billy. You were building websites back then when the internet was oh. just... That's you right. Know, <laughs> uh, like a few years before that, right? In the mid 90s. Yeah, the yeah. Beginning of the internet. You're one of the few people that I knew. It's like Billy knows about the internet back when I first met you in 97. Yeah. Yeah. So. God, I forgot about all that. <laughs> yeah. Man, you're making me feel old. <laughs> I, I, I actually think I might have known you when I still had a pager. You did. You had and, a pager. When I met you, you had a pager and I didn't have a phone when we first met. <laughs> I didn't even have a phone. I remember when you had a pager, Billy, people would page you. Oh, I got a page. Like, oh, what? Yeah. I, thought, I thought it was so modern. I still remember sitting with you at a coffee shop in downtown Stone Mountain. That coffee shop that and you, you were, and Crystal would go to, the two second floor yeah. coffee shop. Yeah. I remember that one. That was our spot. And yeah. you were talking about becoming a producer and... um. I know you had an episode about how you didn't play guitar for a long time, but I was just thinking, like, was it emotionally or hard for you to, like, step away from being an artist to become a producer? Did you feel like you were giving anything up or were you just frustrated? Like, after, we never, we, I think we were so busy. We never really talked about that back then. Yeah, I, I mean, by that time, I was, you know, in my late 30s and I was, I was pretty tired. I mean, the touring part of it was... You know, I was in a band with three other guys that smoked and I didn't smoke and it stuck in the van to and across the United States. And and uh, and and it was just tough. You know, it was hard being on the road and and being in my late 30s. And, and um, you know, that's for you. I hate to say it's for young people. It was back then. Anyways, touring is it it's tough, tough life. That's why labels wanted to sign bands that were young, because they knew that when people got in their 30s, they wouldn't want to go on the road and do all that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, so by the time I went into producing, I was, I was, I was over playing and I, I don't miss playing at all. I don't miss playing live. I mean, if I had a live gig, you know, it'd be great, but I have no interest in, I haven't really played a gig, you know, any serious gig since 2000, 20 years. I probably struggled a little bit more with moving from being an artist to a producer and a mixer. I was just getting frustrated because I wasn't getting enough done. Even when you're touring, you're only gigging an hour or so a night. I, I wanted to work all the time. So back when I started working with you, you told me what I needed to do was just do a lot of projects, do great work, but just build up something, get the projects done, move on to the next one. So I just, I just started working all the time. I was going to do whatever it took to make this work. People didn't have budgets back then when we were working on records. They have, you know, we'd have to get it done in a short period of time, and we just work and work and work and get it done. And and it would be not ninety five out of a hundred times it would be something better, way better than the artists were. <laughs> we made them sound far better than they ever were. Yeah, much to the dismay of A and R people that would come <laughs> out and see them, like what these guys are terrible. What did you play everything? Uh, well, not everything, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I remember doing a session with you where we literally spent a full day on a single bass part with a, I don't even remember what band it was, a full day. Came out great in the end. Yeah. Uh, you may have actually replayed it later on anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I used to, at first when I started, I liked to try to 
let the people do it till they got it right and everything. And then, and then it became where it was, you know, there, there were, you'd get diminishing returns out of it where they would, it would take hours and it still wouldn't be good. So then, uh, then it'd be like, okay, you got two chances <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. and then I'm playing it. <laughs> and they would always be relieved. Honestly, the people that couldn't play very well would be relieved if yeah. I would play their parts for them. So I, I, th- I always thought it was strange, but, um, you, you know, ultimately I would always get, get the spirit of what they were doing though. I could always play it like they would play it, but I'd play it correctly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember a couple of times you doing that and I'm thinking, man, he's playing really sloppy. But then on playback, realizing how much you had really nailed the part. And it was also for me because I was so into like having everything really perfect. It was a big deal for me because it was teaching me how to understand like sometimes it's good for things to rush or drag a little bit. Around that time, I was starting to do a lot of rap music. And that was the same thing there, how everybody wants to be in the pocket and really sit back on the beat. I have this whole list of questions here and things I want to discuss, which we'll never get through all of them. There's no way. But now you just got me thinking of something else. And I, I, when we would work together and the way you would talk to bands sometimes, I'd be like, God, man, what's just You'd be like, so, but, but I learned something and, and there was something, basically the message you were saying to the bands often is like, you are hiring me for my taste. Yes. I'm not yeah. just touching buttons. You're hiring me for my taste and my opinion. And if you don't like it, then fire me. I mean, basically, that's well, is that or or my way or the highway? But it's really isn't that what you're getting hired for, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I ever said my way is the, or the highway, but I implied that for sure. <laughs> I definitely implied that. Um, that's what they hire you for. I mean, when you and I worked together, Billy, I didn't have names for anything. Puffy or kick, or <laughs> this needs a little bit more top end. I mean, I didn't really know what it meant. I knew it when I heard it, though. And then you had to interpret. You puffy, what does that mean? Oh, it's like 100 hertz, you know, or it's 60 hertz is puffy, but it's the air blast. I was you know. literally thinking about puffy kick the other day, and I I, can't, I I don't think I've really ever mastered the puffy kick, man. I got to tell you, <laughs> still trying to figure that one out. Um, oh, hold on. Let me get back to my weird questions here. Um, oh, I got one. What made you? <laughs> um, what made me? My well, my mom was really a positive person, and my dad was a really kind of stern guy. And um, I, my mom made me believe I could do anything, and my dad made me doubt that I could do anything. So that kind of, uh, in, in a way, um, or that I needed to prove that I could do anything to my dad. It was very fascinating, and it really worked well together. But it it uh, it, it made me who I am, and. Um, and my parents were, were the best. I mean, they're the ones that had the biggest influence on me for equally. Yeah, what you're saying about having to prove something, I definitely have seen that in you. And 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 over the years, I feel like that was something for me too. I was gonna ask you about producer stuff. I have a feeling you probably already talked about a lot of this stuff on some of your on your episodes. I you know what? I almost never talk about producer stuff on my channel. Strangely enough, I mostly check the videos that I actually know the least about, which is the the music theory stuff and modes. And I don't know. That's the stuff I like the best. Okay, well, then I'm going to ask you this. Um, And this is such a generic question, but I've actually gotten pretty good answers from it. And that is, what is a producer? Uh, The producer is the person that gets blamed when things don't go right (laughs) and gets no credit when they do go right. (laughs) God, but that's the right. He's the of- scapegoat. That is actually, that is one of the things I learned from you. <laughs> but uh, they're the director of a film, basically. They they oversee the making of a record and, and help make, help the bands realize their vision. Or, or they can be even people that are so directly involved with the thing that they play all the parts. Or they, uh, it depends on what kind of record you make. If I'd work with a singer-songwriter, I would, you know, a lot of times they would hire me because I would play a lot of stuff, you know, just like you would play on the rap records that you would be working on. You'd play guitar or you'd play whatever. And uh, that, that, so that could be part of the job too. The producer could be, could be an engineer. They could, they they can be the arranger. They can hire the arranger. They can hire the mixer. They can be the mixer. You know, there's, there's many, many different things roles a producer can take on. But they oversee the making of a record. You've actually been in a lot of those different roles, but how would you describe yourself as a producer or how you think about yourself as a producer? Well, 
I don't really think about myself as a producer anymore since I, uh, yeah. you know, I'm a producer of video content now. Um, but I think my, my concept of being a producer changed over those, you know, 25 years that I did it a lot. I learned to become a facilitator of people's ideas and, um, and that that's ultimately where I got, you know, long after we worked together, hundreds and hundreds of projects in, then I, you know, developed working relationships with bands that I would do multiple projects with. And that was really, really rewarding for me. It, nothing like coming back in with a, with an artist that you've worked with on a previous record a couple years later and work on a new record. That was always fun. And I always, it was funny. The, uh, um, that there's like a three album limit that I think the band should only work with producers for three albums. And that that's a bit of, then you should get a fresh perspective, even though the Beatles worked with one producer, the whole, their whole career. Uh, they're one of the few that, that, uh, but I mean, George Martin is, uh, was one of a kind, but I would say that my, my ideas as a producer really changed over time. Somebody said to me, you never actually finish an album. You abandon it. <laughs> Well, I, 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 I used to say about Need to Breathe uh, when I worked with them um, that their records would never be done. They would just come out, you know, eventually come out. They never, never really be done. You know, they would work on it until, you know, no, 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 just one last thing, one last thing, one last thing. And you just, okay, whatever. Put the last thing in. And then finally, it's like you got you to gotta let go of it at some, some point. You know, I had a little bit of a head start on you on engineering and mixing and all that, but we're still learning a lot of stuff. And there'd be these times you'd make these cool discoveries and you'd get so excited and be like, I remember a couple times you were saying like, we're like scientists. <laughs> but I'm going to show you something here. I, I don't know if you're going to remember this. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, I know that um, handwriting. So that's that's your handwriting, dude. Like you were telling me about frequencies and like the charts. You actually wrote those. I I actually still have this at my zone studio. I just was too lazy to ever like write another one up. I have one here at my place and I, I wrote my own extra frequencies because I was going higher. But this was kind of an interesting thing for me. I was like, oh my God. And you actually at some point had this crap memorized, but it, it was a big deal for me working in rap music because so much of it's low end. And I really, you know, everything below, you start to get below 80 hertz, 70 hertz, it's huge. But so when you frequency charts like, how how you think about using that, that was my way Billy of of understanding how to EQ things and learning because I I it always frustrated me that I didn't know uh, what I, I didn't have the vocabulary to explain things at the time which why I would use those descriptors the puffy and the sounds boxy sounds whatever and those are actual frequency ranges that those things happen in yeah like if you want to boost the low E string. Uh, Cause it's not speaking, it's at, you know, 41 Hertz, you know, 82 Hertz isn't, e, you know, is E and you can boost it in octaves and things like that. Just knowing middle C is 261 and, and, you know, A is 440 or 220 or 110 or 55 or 27.5, you know, just knowing those things that are, um, is very handy because you want, when you're using EQ, if you can recognize the pitch that it's, you have a woofiness in a certain area, a lot of times too, because we'd work with a lot of heavier rock bands that would do palm muting and you'd have, you know, okay, that's at 140 Hertz. And you, you know, you recognize the pitch of these things and, and just would know that after a while. So I don't know why I memorized that Billy, but I have a good memory for numbers. So. Um, yeah. I, I have a terrible number from uh, memory for numbers, <laughs> which is why that sheet is still there. Oh my god! I like you. I like that you have that. That's great. I need to make another one for the studio. It only hit me recently that oh my god, that's what you wrote it's up. In pretty I, good shape have... since then, Billy. It must not have moved at all. Uh, it's literally not ever moved more than three feet <laughs> from my sitting position at the zone. I I kid you not. I mean that's I'm weird like that. I'll hold on to things, man. <laughs> um, what do you think is the biggest misconception young artists have when they're starting out their careers? That they're gonna have a hit record and be fam <laughs> famous. That's pretty much the biggest misconception, misconception because the chances of it happening are so small that um, that you have to do what you love to do. Ultimately, you got to do stuff that you believe in. I think that goes for anything, for any career. Um, I didn't s start my YouTube channel thinking I'm going to have a you know a million subscribers one day I, you know you just start you make stuff you make videos on things that you're interested in you share share ideas 
So um, that's the thing. You got to do stuff you believe in. That's that's the most important thing for an artist. You know, there's no uh, then then you're never disappointed with stuff. I mean, I think that can even apply to producing. I I can't say that I ever like necessarily loved rap music, but I always found something within each project that I could love. Like I got into it because I just wanted to I just wanted to have drums just smashing speakers. I just wanted things to explode and and I also really like my clients and I found a lot of challenges within it technically also with growth and all that but I think if if you're doing something and there's no love in it you're wasting your time and you'll never be successful if you're just doing it for money only there has to be something that you love in it well there be songs that I listen to that that are I'll people laugh because I like a you know a, a, some pop song that Spike Stent mixed and I'll just marvel at the low end listen to kick drum and, and bass together it's huge both are huge and like what and i no I, I just enjoy it for that i don't really like the song but i like i love listening to it because it sounds so good and people can't that that's a total producer mixer mindset that that you just kind of like you're talking about with with rap music or records that you're on you want the drums to smash you want the low end to be huge and you become such a fan of things that just sound good and that it's it's almost separate from whether you like it as a listening thing you can't even you listen as such a fan of things that are done well you know that's that's the kind of thing that i um you know you know when i called you and told you that i loved the the uh, record that you did with with carmen and and the bryans uh, that just sounds incredibly the mix is just so full all the effects are just right on it now and i love the music so when it's done right and you love the music, that's the pinnacle there. When you actually create something that is sonically beautiful, that sounds full, and that the music speaks to you, that that's the thing that rarely happens. But I appreciate things that are just well done, whether it's rap, whatever it is. I, I love when the low end is huge and controlled and punchy. I love mixes that are punchy. I love when vocals sound great and have interesting effects on them or... Just the way that they're presented. Oh, listen to per, listen to the, to the compression on that vocal sounds amazing. Or, I, you know, have some type of distortion on it or something. And you just appreciate those things because you hear music. Once you do this for years, you hear music in a very different way than your average person. I mean, you're talking about enthusiasm. As you're talking here, it's just making me think. You were talking about getting excited about it. And boy, there'd be times you'd come in the studio and and, and uh, you'd say something like, "You'd be all pumped about a song." You'd like. That's the most manly snare drum I've ever heard in my life. I'm like, listen. I'm like, oh yeah. No, no, listen. That's the most manly snare drum. I'm like, okay, I'm listening. Oh yeah, that is a manly snare drum. But I think the enthusiasm is so important. When I was a kid in high school and I, I knew I wanted to get into music, I would tell people, like my teachers or whatever, everybody's response is like, oh. Like, oh, oh, uh, oh, he's, he's going to, it was almost as if I had said to them, hey, I'm going to be a male prostitute. And they're like, oh. <laughs> and it was considered like a really bad idea. It was almost like being an outlaw, which I, I kind of actually liked. But nowadays it's like weird when I meet people and they're actually trying to push their kids into music. And I'm thinking like, are you crazy? But I think they look at it as a career and I think so many people fail because you know, just American Idol and some of those things I think have been kind of bad for music because it gives us people this wrong idea about what it is. And 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 if you think about lifers like us and people have been around a long time and, and people along back then that were getting into it, it was based on a real just absolute mm -hmm. enthusiasm that just never goes away. Regardless of whether you're making a bunch of money or whatever, it's always there no matter where you're at. And that's what I think keeps us going. Well, I interviewed John Anderson from Yes. He's 75 years old and he's so enthusiastic still about music, you know? And you just see that and you think, well, that's why he's John Anderson. I mean, for, you know, and the voice and the writing the lyrics and things like that. But but uh, that love of music and, and the passion is... is uh, um, and you know, that's the thing, like people to try to force their kids into being musicians and things like that is people have to want to do what they do. You have to be self-motivated ultimately. That's what this, um, that's kind of comes back to the thing where, um, I say I can outwork, you know, 20 year olds or whatever. I'm just, I'm just self-motivated. I mean, that's all I'm trying to say with that, you know, um, 
We're lifers, Billy. Absolutely. Ma'am, thanks a lot for doing this. Appreciate you taking the time. Absolutely. Awesome, Billy. Appreciate it. Have a good day. See ya. See ya. You too. Bye. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. If you did so, remember to hit the subscribe button and come back for more. Thanks for watching.